Welcome to the Deer Society Podcast. Here's your host, Brian Lemke. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the Deer Society Podcast. I'm Brian Lemke, joined today by JJ and Mike Ducart. What's going on, guys? And we're joined by Little Splitter and Skyscraper. Man, there is some bone <laughs> on the table. I, If you're watching on YouTube, uh, you obviously see all the, the racks here on the table. I obviously missed the memo again that it was show and tell day. These guys, they like to team up on me. Usually they're wearing the same sweatshirt or same looking shirt. Today they bring their bucks and here's Brian, no buck. But I got to say that I don't think there'd be much room on this table uh, for another rack. Uh, I don't know if I'm covered up by them or not. Uh, but uh, what happened here in the last couple of weeks? Well, the season was looking a little rough. Um, got into late November post rut and the gun season took a had turn. already started. So, and yeah. then you're, you know, things start to change. You know what? I'm, I'm going to th- do a shout out to a Lynn Ducart, who is not a professional hunter by any means, but probably gave us the best tip that we've had in a very long time that could may very well have led to the success of both of these big deer. What yeah. was that advice? Yeah. So that's my wife. Um, she said, well, she was partially wrong, but it made us go out there. <laughs> we talked about it last podcast. Um, you know, would you rather, you know, not hunt during these gun seasons um, and have somebody else shoot the big buck? Or, you know, go give it a shot at least and have somebody else shoot the big buck? As and a, we were thinking, well, yeah, is there option three? Like, can we shoot the big buck? Yeah. Um, but it, but it got us out there. It got us, you know, taking chances. It's like, well, we might as well give it a chance and not just sit back and yeah, know, let and the that's gun it. season pa- yep. come and go. And because um, our previous strategy has always been, when gun season comes, we don't want to bump all the deer off the property, and you know what I mean. Make it more of a sanctuary, I guess. Basically, basically is the best way to describe it. So if we turned our property into the sanctuary the pressure from the gun hunting and everything else is going to give the deer a better chance. And then we can harvest them in, in a more natural opportune time based on windows and everything. But getting that bit of advice kind of did change our mind. And rather than go in and blow the deer out of there and push them out of there, we still hunted extremely smart but we actually took advantage of hunting those specific windows without putting ourselves in a position to blow the deer out of the property. I know that's a general statement, but that's exactly what we did. We changed our approach for the first time ever, and boom, looky there. Yeah, so like we kind of talked last podcast, um, you know, I think this is the time of year where I, you know, I said too, like I, I like to be, aggressive this time of year it's hard you have to draw that line you don't want to bump the deer off your property but you know season's dwindling down we're running out of chances right so you know if you have deer there and you have your property set up you know the right way you can get in and be a little bit more aggressive without hopefully bumping those deer off you guys are dialing in your property more and more every year um creating those opportunities for yourself um well, you know, let me add something here because people, I don't think people really grasp what's going on where we hunt. And we've never had our own property to ever hunt or manage ever in our lifetimes. So everything that you've ever seen from illusion, creating products, understanding deer behavior, all that, that all came from either um, shared land that multiple parties were hunting that we didn't know who they were. Um, you know, just asking friends, knocking on doors. That's the only type of hunting we did to build this whole platform and this product line. And it's only been the last three years that we've had an opportunity to do a management program, an actual management program. And we can talk about management and the aspects of that. And I'm going to love to do that um, at some point. But if you add that to the fact that, and this is what people really don't get, Minnesota puts the gun season back to back to back firearms right in the peak of all the deer activity. 
So we catch a little bit of pre-rut as archery hunters. Now, I'm not bad-mouthing anybody or anything like that, but I personally do not like it because it doesn't give you the opportunity like other states, like Iowa, who put the gun season after the rut. So it's a post-rut deal. Um, I would say Wisconsin is a late to post rut. Would that be a good way to describe that one? And I'm not sure about some of the other states because your rut is going to change as the further you move south a little bit and stuff like that. But it's the worst case scenario for managing trophy, trophy deer in Minnesota is to have all that pressure during that peak time. And if you don't have that management mentality, which doesn't make you a bad hunter or a good hunter or whatever, Minnesota has always been that traditional, everybody get together, kind of like a Wisconsin and a Michigan deal where you go to deer camp. And you would have, I grew up hunting this way, 10, 12, 14 people, and you go push the woods. And, you know, if you see an antler, you get super excited and you're shooting at anything with white on its head. And so it's super, super tough. For Minnesota. And I just wanted to put that out there. What a big challenge it is to be able to achieve what we've just achieved this one season. These are the first two deer that came off a of property in three years. And there was well, at least a dozen, I would say, deer that have been shot more than that, probably 10 a year, probably two dozen deer within a two to three mile radius, which is what these deer, all deer will travel typically during the rut, you know, that mile to three miles, and uh, probably two dozen bucks that were taken out. When we're letting them go, letting them go, letting them go, year after year after year, and being patient, and that's, you know, that's what created this success. It really is, is that patience and the first step of management. And I've been thinking about this all year long. I don't want to get long-winded here, but all year long I've been thinking about how can we help people find, well, first of all, understand what management is and what it means and what the different aspects are of it and allow people to manage at their comfort level. And we're helping our neighbors now. Our neighbors are changing their mindset, you know, and they're realizing, oh, wow, this is an asset. We're seeing more deer, but it it just boils down to the first two, there's just two Core simple things that I came up with. One is, are you willing to pass a deer that has antlers on its head? Can you watch a buck go by? That's the first step, okay? And the second step, and these are the two most important things in management of the very beginning of it. Can you identify a deer, who he is and what age he is? And if you can do those two things, if you can pass a deer, if you can let that deer go, and if you can identify a deer, knowing who that deer is and what age that deer is, things are going to change for you like you never could ever imagine. You're going to be shooting way bigger bucks because you're going to get that first generation and that second generation. And I got, I'm just, I'm so excited, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, about being able to get back out into the field, okay? Not everybody knows that I've retired now, and my retirement is still being part of all deer society and everything, but I don't have to run the companies anymore because I'm, I'm out. JJ and Chris have taken over, and the amount of hours and time I was able to log this year got me back into my element where I could start studying the deer and looking at their behaviors and the experiences I got and the footage I got this year, I didn't need to kill a buck. I had a great successful season. But because I, JJ and other people that I hung around with started rubbing off on me and I was able to log those hours, well, that's why I was successful this year. But there was one time where I was filming three generations of buck in the same food plot at the exact same time. It was six bucks. It was two buttons. It was uh, three year and a halfs and a two and a half year old. And then later that night, another two and a half came in. You get that kind of generations, three generations surviving because you're able to pass up antler and identify age 
I'm telling you, man, it's, it's, it'll change everything. And that's just the beginning. That's the core beginning of management. I'll leave it there. Yeah. <clears throat> that was a lot. Um, just thinking, so kind of big picture of the property too um, and management in the area. I do know who used to hunt the property, still communicate with some of those guys, kind of know the history of the area. So there was a gentleman that hunted the property that we now own hunted for 25 years and i think the biggest buck they ever shot was um in the 60s so like 160 some inch 10 and i would guess it's probably a five-year-old so that's you know the past 25 years of hunting here one buck well we just shot two that were five five and a half one and then the other one's six and a half and they're both in the 60s as well so it just shows that even after a couple years in a pretty i wouldn't say poor but a not ideal situation uh, management wise going in Right. To achieve this is something that, you know, it just shows that you can do it. And these aren't the only big ones out there either. It's not like, you know, we shot them and now they're all gone. I mean, there's going to be more oh. big ones coming in. Our neighbors are starting to work with us now too. So they're figuring it out. They're seeing. You know, it's it, like 10 years ago or five years ago, if I would have hunted this property, it would have been like really rough. Like see a couple, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, that would have been about it. So that just kind of puts it into perspective of what we've done in just a couple of years. And add that Minnesota factor to it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And I, and, I, and the Minnesota factor is a, a big thing. You know, I, I don't want to <clears throat> talk like we, I, I feel the same way with our Minnesota gun seasons. I think, um, you know, obviously it, it pains you as an archery hunter to have those gun seasons come in so early. Now, that being said, I don't want to, sound on here like we're bashing uh non-archery hunters either because there's a lot of gun hunters out there that are probably pretty happy that that that's the the time that those gun seasons are here and and let's face it there's more gun hunters than archery hunters and provides them more of an opportunity uh probably at a deer having the gun seasons there so you know i think you have to look at it from from differences but i think you hit the nail on the head mike um when you said that there's there's a foundation to management and and it's possible you guys have proved that um to to manage uh, a property and change the dynamics of it completely from what it used to be. Um, you know, you guys have done a really good job dealing with your neighbors, getting them on board. Um, it, it, it's obviously possible. And, and I think anybody listening to this, you know, uh, if you're dealing with a, a property and you want to manage for better deer, um, you know, it, it, it's possible. You guys are proving. Yeah. And I think that, you know, one other thing I want to say, Mike, before you jump in here real quick is, uh, you know, I think one of the other keys to you guys harvesting this deer, these deer, uh, the past couple of weeks here is one, it all started with the management, all the work and effort that you put in to, to have them there, right. And, and to build the property. But the other thing that I see from the outside is these deer weren't super regular there early season. You didn't go in there. A key was patience over the years, but patience short term here this season too, because you didn't go in there and just hunt to hunt to hunt to hunt to hunt when the deer weren't there. You were very cautious. You hunted when the time was right. You hunted the edges and you didn't go in there and piss pound it and blow out all the deer before these deer had the chance to come in there and feel comfortable. And when they did, then you guys went in there, you hunted and you took advantage of it. So kudos to you. I think it was a uh, patience on a long-term scale and short-term scale. Yeah, you know, and on that note, um, I don't, I'm, please don't think that I'm some kind of archery purist kind of person. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. I have no um, problem with gun hunting and whatever, any of that. In fact, I embrace all hunting. I embrace every single deer hunter out there. I've devoted my entire life to helping them become more successful. I mean, that's just, that's my entire life has been devoted to that. There's zero prejudice to how you take a deer coming from me. And I don't want people to think that there is that. I'm an archery hunter. My situation, um, you know, the older traditional and some of these things that we talked about do have an impact on what we're doing on our private land. That was my point. And my secondary point I'm trying to get across is that we have people that are interested and want to do more and shoot bigger bucks. And so that's what I was trying to get at. You can absolutely 100% do the same thing being a firearms hunter. 
It doesn't matter what you're shooting the deer with. It makes no difference. Now, I would not ever expect people or judge a person for not being able to put in the time that JJ and I and Chris and everybody involved with this puts in to get this kind of an asset. Because like, like JJ said, majority of all people are gun hunters and they don't have the time to put in like we do. And I guarantee you the only reason I had the success, and I said this, is because I was able to put that time in this year. The past 10 years, I was not able to put that kind of time in, and I wasn't able to get out and hunt and do it the way that you really need to to you know harvest these, these great deer. Now, obviously, they got to be on your, on your thing. But I just don't want to come off, people think that I'm a purist. That's not what this is at all. And as a gun hunter, and that's where my mind's going, if you're a firearms hunter and you're a traditional hunter like we have in Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, if you want to go another level and if you want to start management, I'm going to try and think of ways and that you can do that. And, you know, even this is my position, and I hope it's not too controversial for everybody, but we have this youth firearms season. And everybody's like, oh, we got to get the youth involved. We got to get them involved. You don't want to spoon feed everybody either. Because if it's like, I mean, <laughs> I got to be careful how I, how I describe this, but we give our kids so much. I gave my kids way more than my mom and dad gave me. My kids are giving their kids way more, you know, attention, time, energy, and things that, that we even gave them. And that's just kind of the trend. I, don't, I think you can overdo that is the point I'm trying to get to, to teach them. And to give them that experience at a higher level, instead of spoon feeding everybody, I would say that would be a better approach. Now, what does that mean? I'm not going to get into any kind of comments because I don't really know. I hadn't really thought about it, but it's a point that I wanted to make. So if you're being patient with your kids and you're teaching them this, that's what I did with the boys. I was part of that uh, shotgun culture. I was a waterfowler. So my hunting for deer hunting was, all right, it's deer season. Let's go out for this week, go down to, you know, Doug's and stay at the farm. And there's 12 of us and we're pushing, you know, timber and all that hard work. And uh, it, it got to a point where I felt that it was a little bit dangerous, to be honest with you. And that if I'm going to bring my young boys up into this culture, they're not going to learn what I feel they need to learn to become and to get hooked on, to be honest with you. Because if you start having close interaction with deer, that adrenaline is just as much as shooting at a deer running, you know, 50, 60 yards away. In fact, it's even more because you can't move, you're interact, you know. And so that's the approach I decided to take. Bought them some bows, sat them down at 11, 12 years old, put them in a stand and have them experience those kinds of things, a fong walking by, a, you know. And just that experience, I think, is a, a better direction and a better level long term. That, that another ramble from Mike, so I'm going to back out here. No, oh, that that all makes sense. So, and I, I I look at that, you know, just from the standpoint of yeah, I mean, it's so more it's so much more valuable to give them that experience, teach them something, teach them how to about how to better the land and create habitat and, and you know grow deer and and what it means to shoot a deer of this caliber. Don't just put them out there and let them shoot a deer of that caliber. And you know that happens, and hey, that's great. But you know, teach them a lesson about it so they can take it and and use it down the road. Yeah, and that's not even directly related to kids. I mean, there's a difference. I'll just summarize this all with one statement. There's a difference between being a shooter and being a hunter. You could be a shooter. Someone puts you in the stand, puts you in the blind. All you do is pull the trigger or you're actually hunting. So that's my summary. Now let's move on to some tactics. Yeah, let's, talk, big bucks. let's talk about strategy. So, you know, we're after Thanksgiving now here in Minnesota. It's, it's post rut. We're transitioning now from post rut into late season, right? So deer kind of gonna start getting back on those food sources as it gets colder here into December. But let's kind of backtrack here uh, a week or two ago um, into that post rut. So, JJ, you were able to, to take this amazing deer, skyscraper, six and a half, off the property, first deer taken off the property. Tell me about your history with skyscraper and, and what tactics went into kind of finally closing the deal. Yeah, so just a little backstory on him. Six and a half year old buck. First set of sheds we ever found or I ever found was in 
the 2019 spring. So that was the 2018 sheds. And at the time I had some video of him. I thought he was a two year old. And then we all looked at the sheds in, in my office, I think a couple years ago. And we're like, no, there's no ways to. And then we decided, <clears throat> yeah. So he was a three year old at that point. Um, and kind of just grew the story from there. I mean, the next year he showed up on camera a little bit bigger. I think he broke a G2 or something. Um, we didn't really pursue him Four four and a four and a half year old buck, but nice deer, nice, tall, um, narrow. There were some older bucks around or more dominant bucks around. So didn't pursue him. You know, neighbors were trying to get him. Some of them, a few of them were passing him up. Um, somehow slipped through the season. I think he even got shot at by, by some different guys at, at some point. Um, then five year old buck the next year, which would have been last year, 2020. Again, one neighbor even passed him up, which is very surprising. Um, as a five-year-old, he looked pretty big. A lot of video again. We did not really pursue him again a little bit. I actually tagged out early somewhere else, so I didn't have a chance to even hunt him by the time he filtered into the property. He was kind of on my radar last year. I saw him in uh, in person, and uh, my God, man, those G2s were freaking huge. And so he was definitely on my list. And like JJ said, that one of the neighbors passed him up. Um, but yeah, I kind of almost had him patterned, but got busy and, you know, didn't really get aggressive. Yeah. And then late season is real, con or real, um, real consistent on camera, um, kept showing up, just kept watching the cameras, just wanted him to survive. <clears throat> and then two of the neighbors picked up his shed. So throughout the years, I got the three and a half set, um, as a four and a half, one neighbor got both of those sheds. And then the next year, two different neighbors both got one side. And we had them all in the shop and did some filming um, this past spring with all the sheds. And it was kind of cool to see him grow a little bit. You know, from three to four, he didn't really put on hardly anything, a couple inches. Five, he really put on the mass at the base. And then, you know, six. It doesn't look like he grew much, but he put on quite a bit of mass, some characters, um, a nice flyer on the G2. So... I mean, the, consistently growing, but not huge steps like you see on some other deer. Well, the bases are what, eight? Yeah, around the burrs and stuff was eight. You know, you get up in the actual base measurements a little, it's about six, maybe a little under six. But that's a big, big first measurement on a buck. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the history of the buck. We call him Skyscraper. And he was pretty much on everybody's hit list for sure. Um, he was our number one or two on the hit list this year it's kind of hard to, to rank them all the time but yeah he was definitely one we were we were going for i remember the first uh um trail cam pick of the very first year we got the property and we didn't um it was late kind of when po property was purchased and that deer came through and we saw him and jj's like oh man that thing's really narrow and but it's high and I, I remember saying, I said, you know, that's the kind of buck I'd love to shoot. You know, I've never shot a really high, tall buck. And I said, those things score better than you think they do. And I remember that. And, uh, yeah, that's a comment I wanted to make on him. That deer is one, uh, one of those deer that really surprise you. You know, we, we, you guys had looked at thousands, hundreds of, of trail camera photos and videos of them. And, you know, I'd, I'd got to see a few and... I remember last year when the neighbors brought in the sheds, um, I was speechless actually uh, on how big holding those sheds in, in your hands, how big they were, how massive that deer was, how long his tines actually were. And, uh, <clears throat> I think that I actually made the comment to JJ holding those sheds or after they left, I'm like, man, you messed up. Like you should have been chasing that deer a little harder because really surprised, surprised me, uh, how big he was. Um, so, you know, history on him now, let's move into this year. What, what did it take to actually kill him this year? When yes. did he show up? <clears throat> so he kind of did his thing where he wasn't around all summer. Um, and it's kind of, that's kind of how this property is. Not a lot of the big bucks are even Don't. around during the summer. And it could be because we're, you know, making trails and planting plots and a lot of activity, doing a lot of stuff, trying to get it ready. But <clears throat> he didn't show up till middle, middle of October. I think it was, I can't remember the date. And it was just a couple pictures, and it was not a real good picture. And he had his head leaned back, so you could just see the frame, but you couldn't see really what he had going on. And it looked real thin, a nighttime picture. But 
at least, you know, we knew he was there and we kind of had some stands set up. Like one in particular, I thought the hidden plot stand, I thought like, that's the one that's going to kill this buck. Based on his last year's behavior, what I, I experienced with him and, and what we've been documenting. Yeah. And then, you know, I thought it's going to be late October, early November, one of them first, you know, it was that seven day stretch that week. We'd jump in there, he'd show up and he'd start daylight and we were going to get a crack at him. And yep. Pretty much he just disappeared. So <clears throat> from late October, it was like the 20 something, you know, we were getting some good pictures and then he just disappeared for like three weeks. Yeah. We and couldn't figure out what worried. happened. <laughs> Didn't have cell camera, cell cameras everywhere. So it's not like you can really see real time what's going on. But then I pulled some SD cards and we got them on November 7th. Was it November 17th? No, it wasn't November. Anyway, pressure probably pushed him in. We just posted the video the other day. I can't remember the day, but he came in, he was limping in, so we thought he got shot. Yeah, there was a big chunk of skin hanging down below his arm, and so we thought he got, it was a low hit, you know, maybe brisket or something. Or maybe that was back in October. That was an October video. Yeah, it was October video. <clears throat> so that's why he disappeared for like three weeks. He got hurt. And then he pretty much, I don't know if he hunkered down on our property or went into standing corn or what happened, but he just kind of went completely nocturnal off the radar. None of the neighbors were seeing him. We weren't seeing him. And it was kind of like, man, did he die? Well, he, well, he showed up that week and we caught him on, tra once again, trail camera. And we got a local buck. We call him Patches. He's just a little two and a half year old, eight. And those two, Patches is just a psycho. You know, he thinks he's the, uh, uh, whatever. He just thinks he's Mike Tyson or something. And so he tries to square off with, uh, it was Patches, right? Yeah. yeah. He tries to square off with him. Well, he's injured. And he, actually on the trail camera, he pushed him, pushed him off, but he was hurt, you know. And I'm sure it didn't end that well for Patches. But yeah, that was kind of cool to see. We'll show that, I'm sure. Yeah. So he, I mean, that kind of threw a wrench in our whole plan to shoot this buck because it, I mean, you're looking at that window where he was, the previous year, he's making a lot of mistakes, daylighting. Um, right around that Halloween first week of November. And he was nowhere to be seen. So it's like, we didn't even know really what to do. And then <clears throat> he started showing back up. It's like, okay, he survived. Neighbors are getting pictures. We're getting some videos and you can see he's, you know, healed up pretty well. But at that point it's already, you know, locked down or heading into post rut. So then strategies kind of started to change and it was more of just, you know, Try to get some post rut cruising, uh, watch the cameras. We started getting a couple pictures of him kind of cruising midday. One thing that really got me excited about, you know, him showing back up again was the fact that he was actually actively out breeding again and he would, was had healed up. Now, I don't know if that was adrenaline or what, because when he went into the, um, the processor, uh, he's a friend of ours, a guy that we know, he does it for a living, and... Uh, he said, my God, I'd love to see the, the buck that beat him up because he got gorged underneath the armpit. And that was that big chunk of skin that we were looking at. And when we were taking pictures, I looked, and when we were actually gutting him, you know, field dressing him, there was a hole the size of, what, a baseball? And you could see all the way into the front quarter. And I guess after the, the processor got done, said he was all bruised up in the back and he was punctured into the loin. He had to cut a piece of the loin out. So it was a brutal fight. Yeah, so his armpit was all tore up, and that's what we saw in the video, and it was the 17th of October, now that I'm thinking back. Um, his back had a hole in it, right in that back strap. It was all pussy, and then his back two legs were really bruised up on the fronts. Yeah, he got into a pretty big battle, and it's... Maybe <laughs> we kind of from think. the other buck laying here. Sure, surely could be. Those were the two, the two big dogs running around. It's it seemed like. I mean, look at the hook on this main beam. You just get that <laughs> under an armpit, and yep, you'd be in trouble. Absolutely. So, uh, what happened? How how did you eventually meet skyscraper face to face? Yeah, so we were hunting pretty pretty consistent not real like we said earlier not real hard not diving in deep but edges you know playing the wind out um the wind blowing outside of the core <clears throat> and just trying to get eyes on him because eventually we wanted to make an aggressive move uh, but all of our stands were kind of set up on the perimeter and there was a day it was november 20th um kept hunting hard hunted the morning didn't see anything and i wanted to do an all-day sit i think it was a saturday 
um, wanted to do an all day sit and flip to the other side of the property because there was a wind switch. So the wind was south in the morning and it was going to be north in the evening. And then midday it was doing a little bit of a shift. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe today is the day I need to just do an all day or and just flip sides of the property and switch stands. Well, in the process, I thought, well, my wife's at home with two kids. Got to go home. She'll probably help her a few hours. <laughs> I'll sit out the midday. <clears throat> so I went home a little bit and helped out. And and then we got our cell cams running an inch or about noon that day. Here he goes. He did the, right when the wind was shifting, exactly. he made the move. And I was like, oh man, I totally missed that. Because that you would have gone to that stand. And that was the stand I was going to. Yeah. is the one he walked right into. And so I thought, man, now I got to, well, first of all, I missed that whole window. So that's really frustrating waiting all these years to get a crack at him but you know and him and i were talking and we're going back and forth we're texting blah, 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 blah. you know what do we do blah, 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 blah. and it's like you know what i guarantee you because of his injury that he's barely going to food kidding he's he's not traveling a long ways you know what i mean he's probably bedded right close close by that stand so and him and I are going back about this and sneak in there as quiet as you can, get in there super early, you know, I mean, as early as you can for the evening hunt. And uh, then you can kind of tell you were going to like trim some branches because that particular stand, because he was needing water. So there was water in the area. Go ahead. Yeah. So you have not hunted the stand, but it was a new one. We popped up and it was an, it's an awesome stand in a little red oak. A lot of leaf cover, but a thin little tree, not, no, no big trees. Um, water in front of you and not a lot of shooting lanes at all, really thick. So, And you need a north wind. So I've played this stand before, and the wind got a real swirly on me because of the elevation. So I actually was waiting for that wind to shift more towards like a northwest instead of just straight west when he moved in there. So it started to shift more of a northwest, and I knew it was going north. So gave it about an hour. It was about two hours until I actually got in there after him, um, after he passed on the camera. Brought in the loppers. I was going to do some trimming of some lanes, but I brought it to the base of the tree, and it was just too quiet. And I thought, you know, if he's bedded on this knob where I think he could be with that wind, you know, I just can't blow that opportunity and go out there and start cutting cedar branches and stuff. So left the loppers at the base of the tree and just, you know, started sitting there. Um, and all the neighbors, you know, it must have been sighting in day for the second oh, gun season. It yeah, was just we were going back and forth. I was in the blind 40 or 50 day, shots from all least. directions. And I thought, man, that's going to drive him nocturnal. I mean, it was so loud. I jumped at one time and I heard a whiz another time. It was kind of getting out of control. Um, but I thought, man, he's not going to move. You know, we got the security. I didn't blow him, blow him out of there. He's definitely not going to go toward that shooting. He's not so going to go toward gonna the stay shooting. Hunkered. And I thought, well, he's close, but I'm not where the food is. And at night, bucks or deer are going to walk toward the food, and the food's the opposite direction. So I thought, well, that's not good. So with about 45 minutes left, um, started to calm down. Shooting stopped and actually did a little bit of calling. Um, so this is one of the biggest, that's the biggest buck I've ever called in. I called him right in. What was that calling sequence like? Did some estrus bleats, and I put put the extinguisher up more toward the fawn because I like that high pitch. So I went, like, basically all the way up on the slide up to the fawn. Just some real quiet because I didn't know if he was, you know, 50 yards, 100 yards, what he was. And it was fairly calm. Just some nice, long, quiet bleats. Um, something real natural. And then did a little bit longer grunt. Not quite a breeding grunt, but like a three-second grunt. Just a, a real stretched out, long, deep grunt on the deepest setting. Buck grunt waited a little bit, did some contact grunts, and then did some real burly, like kind of barking type grunts, <laughs> but kept it kind of natural, not real, not real loud. And then a couple more, I'll call them fawn bleats, but really it was intended to sound like a high pitched doe. I was recording all that on the tactic cam over the shoulder. So I know that kind of the timing and it was like three minutes later, he walked right in. So I'll, I'll analyze that for you. I'll assess it. <clears throat> the, what he described was at that time of the year, which is um, past the peak rut probably, a lot of does have been bred. And so just like a two-year-old is super, you know, explosive, hormonal, and, and, you know, aggressive and just emotional, 
I think your younger does experience the same thing. And once again, I documented some of this, and I'm, I want to talk about that through a, maybe a, a mini series with everything I documented this year. So those upper range uh, doe bleats simulates that younger doe super emotional, which would make sense for a big buck that's already been breeding and looking for his next doe. Um, and then you add that young buck grunting. That's an immature buck. Once again, emotional, not really long breeding grunt, just kind of trying to figure it out. Imagine like a Jake or, you know, a younger turkey trying to gobble. It, it, it's kind of like down that lane. And so he's showing immature doe, immature buck. He's got this big dominant buck bedding close by. And he literally stood him up out of the bed when he never should have gotten up because of all that gun pressure. The food was the other way. He stood him up and walked him in to see what the heck is going on because of his instincts. He's still breeding. You know what I mean? And that's my breakdown of it. Yeah, and I think I know exactly. Now that <clears throat> you know he reacted that quick, he had to have been bedded right there on that first knob. Yeah, you would have you would have blown him out if you'd have went to so trim and started stuff. Trimming lanes yeah. and... Well, <clears throat> unbelievable. Definitely a hunt breakdown that is is going to be a wild one to look for. Uh, actually, a white tails from scratch episode too that uh, is going to be released here uh, sooner than later. So keep an eye out for that. Unbelievable deer. Unbelievable story. Um, years and years of history to finally see this buck. Um, and there's no ground shrinkage. <laughs> What did she think when you walked up to him? Yeah, he's got one of those bodies that was kind of like a horse. You know, his neck was real long and upright and long body, and so it kind of makes him look real small. And it was hard to, like, when we were taking photos and stuff, just the such a tight, tall rack. Like, it's deceiving how big he really is, you know. But once you get your hands on him and you got those huge bases, you know, 8-inch around those burrs and, you know, I don't know if they're 13-inch. G2s or what Those they are. Those twos and, big and threes and just, are ridiculous. Like, overall, just, tall. yeah, really, really great buck. Yeah. And uh, a six-year-old buck, you can tell. Yeah. Yeah, when you walk up to a deer like that, you can't help but be impressed, you know, when you put your hands on them. And again, it goes back to the sheds from the year before. And then especially this year, those bases, the mass, the time length, the everything you get, you just get something like that. It's You look at both these deer and you just... The, the mass and the ultra maturity of, of these bucks is just something to, to be impressive. Score or no score, it's it's the maturity level of these deer and the feeling that you get when you pick them up is something pretty special. Um, so I want to transition now. So let's fast forward from Skyscraper, a couple weeks down the road. Mike, you're, you're hunting hard now. Skyscraper's out of the picture. What's going through your head? What's your strategy? Um, it's a... It's a mixed emotion scenario for me because Skyscraper obviously was, you know, a, a favorite of mine and, you know, it was all of our number one target. And the fact that he went down when I got that text, I'm sitting in the blind. Yeah, you're hunting. I'm hunting. The other side of the property. Yeah, the other side of the property. And so when I got that text, I'm like, oh my God. And it's at the magic hour. I mean, you know, there was, it was like perfect time. I, mean, I should, shouldn't have been moving or nothing out of that blind. I'm like, well, you need some help right now. I'm going to pack up right now. I'm coming up. You know, that's how excited I was to just see the deer and everything. And so that whole day and the, the first deer off the property, I mean, it was just such a, it was such a celebration. It was so awesome. And it meant more than really, it, it was such a different feeling than any other deer that we've ever got. Because, and we've shot some big deer. I was super excited for JJ to, to shoot uh, um, uh, Curly. I mean, that was a, a long, venturous deer. And Beamer, but him off the, for, off the property. And if you, if you understand how much time and effort we put in, how much money we put into it, and the opportunity, it just brings it all together. It's a fulfillment of... Of, of the the process of setting up the land and the patience of never shooting never shooting a deer off that property for three years and then to do it and be successful and everything you ever hoped and thought and wanted and expected happened it's it's just a bigger 
sense of, of, of satisfaction, I guess. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. The satisfaction was, was awesome. Um, so yeah, so there, th- that's that. And now it's like, well, you know, I don't, we don't really need to kill another deer off the property now. Well, then JJ, no, he wasn't going to have none of that attitude. And he goes, dad, you need to get out there. You need to go, you gotta. And he was hounding me every day. There's this window, that window. And it got a little nice. And I went golfing one day and I didn't sit well with him. And, you know, there were some things going on, but I knew because I had the time and it really, it hit me. You know, between, and I'm going to, I'm going to do a shout out to Rod White. Rod White has been, you know, a a tremendous source of information for both JJ and I and Deer Society and, and been a big, big part of this. And really every, all of our pro staff, you know, all those guys, you know, Andy and, and, and uh, Colton and I know, and Dan, you know, I could keep going on and on with all the people, but that's a lot of information. And this is the first time I've had the time to absorb and think about it during hunting season. And it's like, you know what? You need to put in the time and effort if you want to shoot one of these big bucks because JJ, we, we, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty common on what we know and what we understand because we work so closely together. But the difference between JJ and the, and the rest, me and Chris, is that he's out there logging the time and the hours. So when we identify those windows, he's out there every single time and he'll hunt a deer. He'll put, you know, anywhere from a dozen to two dozen sits in, in windows just to have one chance to see that buck that he's probably never seen in real life. And I've never done that. Not because I don't want to, not because it's because I never had the opportunity. Now I had the opportunity. It's like, you know what? Get your crap together here, get back out there, and start logging some time this year. And so I had a big injury, and we can go on about all this kind of stuff, why, you know, reasons where things just didn't go the way we had hoped it would or expected it would. But it all all came out. Long story short, I shot this deer right out of the stand that took me out of the season almost, um, tearing up my, you know, my calf and my Achilles, and wasn't able to walk for about a month I was on crutches, but so it's about it came the time full circle on you. It did. It came full circle and it was about logging the time and getting the opportunity. And really that's, that's what created this opportunity. This is the very first time of all the years that we um, documented this buck. We call him little splitter. So let's start the story. Um, we found the sheds on the property match set little splits. In fact, there was an epic photo by some guy sitting at this table here that we posted that showed Mike trying to give him a little bit of street credit holding these sheds. And you could see the reflection out of my sunglasses. And it was just the neatest photo. So when we posted it, and I think, is that my profile or something somewhere? It could be, yeah. Anyway, I'm getting all these comments. Oh, what a cool photo, blah, blah, blah. So that's little splitter. So he he was meant for me, I think, from the beginning. And little splitter was... The littler of the two bucks with splits. That's why we call them little splitter because right. the bigger splitter and a little splitter. The bigger splitter got taken out by some neighbors on a whole nother story. But um, so, all right. So little splitters left. We know he's left, and we also have a buck named Peyton. Peyton, and Peyton's not a core buck. Little splitter is a core buck. Okay. Peyton shows up at the end of the rut every year. Uh, he just he likes it, I think, in our area. He just feels comfortable, and he shows up. And they're both the same age. Yeah, both the same age. So now that the six and a half year old's out, little splitters a five and a half. Little splitter starts being more dominant and showing up. And really, I don't think uh, uh, the two deer they kind of gave each other each side of the property for the most part, wouldn't you say? They kind of gave each other space, and that's what we designed the product or the the uh, um, property to do was to hold two to three, five and a half on up bucks. That was our goal, and we did it this year. And uh, so that's what's going on. So he's him and Peyton are showing up, this and that, blah blah blah. We start patterning window. The window showed up exact same thing like JJ, and. 
you know what? I just had a feeling I was going to shoot a deer out of that stand that took me out. And it was one of those days where we had the wind shift again, okay? And I knew the wind shift, and it was a little stronger wind. And I knew the wind shift wasn't going to be in my favor, but it was right on the edge where there was enough wind velocity where I felt I could get away with it. And I know JJ, if I would have asked him, hey, should I sit in that stand? No, you, you know, he would have said no, because it, a good chance of blowing it up, because the wind was going right down the corn line in uh, IMAX. And so they are in the timber and they're coming out of that timber going into that corn and that wind's blowing right over top of that one little corridor. But they can interact and they can work the food to the east, they can work the food to the west or the uh, timber to the west and and bed in there and I'm not going to blow nothing out. So I felt I got to do super scent control and I have enough confidence and faith in phase and I, I know it sounds like a commercial I knew I could get in there and them deer weren't going to win me because I documented this stuff all year long deer directly downwind and I'm not talking about 15 20 mile an hour wind blowing through them not picking it up I'm talking about a wind in this exact stand that was so calm I had a deer in a scrape two yards well actually my tree was the overhanging branch for the scrape that I'm sitting in a buck gets in there, does the scrape. I drop a wind floater. It landed exactly in the middle of the scrape in a calm wind. And so that tells you that, and this deer had no idea I was in the tree right up above him. No idea. None of the deer in the area did all night. So I'm like, I got so much confidence in the phase in that I got that wind that's right on the edge of no that I'm going to go for it. So I made sure all the clothes were dialed in. I made sure everything was all out is all about scent control hunt and i just i well the this here's the, the big secret tip is i did two layers or two applications of lotion because the lotion really sinks in good and if you do heat up you know you're burning up all that scent as you manufacture it if you really dose yourself with that lotion i just the lotion to me is 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 huge but anyway so i i'm, I'm like super phase super phase man with my cape on <laughs> and so I, I get out there and I'm taking my time and it's, it's kind of warm because it was a south wind and it's, but, but this is the window, man. We got the wind shift. So I get up in there and I'm dressed right and everything else. And I sit up there and I'm like, well, I got to be like super stealth, man. I can't be rattling. I can't be calling. I don't want to create any attention to myself at all. I want to let this naturally occur so that I can see if the deer are going to pick up on me at all. And so I know you're not going to like this, but I didn't film hardly anything. I just sat there like a little statue and just kind of looked around, looked around, looked around. And for the first time, I took the crossbow up into this stand, okay? The crossbow has been specifically for the blind um, all year long. And it got to a point where I was having some issues with the equipment because I've never shot a crossbow and I wasn't familiar with like the, you know, the scopes and things like that. And I, there could have been some damage to the scope or anyway, it was confusing and it was inconsistent. And so we got those bugs worked out. And I know Brian, you helped me a lot with that. And uh, JJ's like, keep shooting that thing, make sure it's right on, you know, and I'm glad I did because I lost two bolts right away and if i hadn't done that i wouldn't have known it was off and then we switched out scopes we did all the dialing and then i was really super confident from there and um so anyway so i take the crossbow out and i, and I bring it up into the stand and i'm sitting there mr stealth and it's sitting in my lap it's not hanging up or nothing because i can't even i don't even want to move because i know if they see any movement it's going to be psh, psh, you know because the does come out first all that kind of stuff Sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, not really expecting much, but we did have um, data of Peyton showing up there. Chris sat in that stand, uh, what, a few days before? That was the very first day he showed up, wasn't it? Chris goes, oh, there was this big eight-pointer coming in. I was so excited, and I was going to shoot him, and I didn't know if I should, and I didn't want to get confused because Chris isn't hunting that much. He's not up on all the deer. And I'm going, well, what did he look like? And I go, Chris, I think you saw Peyton for the first time this year. And I'll be darn. We checked the footage, and then he hit that trail camera. Peyton showed up for the very first day. Chris could have actually shot him 
except for the light ran out and then the camera was that we got that one oak tree where the, the leaves are in it. Um, so it didn't happen that night for Chris. And then a few days later, I got that wind window. Chris couldn't hunt that day because now he's me. He's got to take care of the business. And I'm like, <laughs> I've seen an opportunity. Dude, I'm going. I'm getting me a deer. All that stuff happened. And the does come out, blah, 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 blah. The normal day, this and that. Nothing's catching me. Nothing's picking up on my wind. I'm feeling really good about it. And they came out and they went into there and I'm like, okay, here we go. And uh, I'm looking around and I'm checking. And that day I would have bucks come through into my shooting lanes. And instead of filming like I normally do, I was taking my crossbow and I was looking, all right, pulling it up to see if I could get away with it, getting it on them and finding my window, see what it feels like. Cause it's different hunting through like a scope than it is with a bow. You can see everything in front of you with a bow, but when you put that scope on them, it's like totally, it's like a different world. If you feel like you're blinded almost, except for what exactly you're looking at, but you're not seeing big picture. And so I did, I went through that step process a couple, three times actually to get a feel for if this happens, I want to be ready for it. And um, so anyway, so the does come out, this and that, starting to get that activity toward the end of the night, 20 minutes before the end of shooting light, still got a good 10 minutes of camera light left. The does went in, I'm looking around because I'm hearing things, and I look back, and there's this big body standing there right where the does came out. And they had been out there for five minutes. And I see this big body, and I look, and I pull up the binos, and it's a little splitter. And now my brain just goes, <clears throat> blows up. You know, that's just me. I'm an emotional guy. JJ's calm and collective and he's, you know, methodical. Not me, man. When it hits me, it's just like, whoa. And, you know, Rod Weiss <laughs> helped me a little bit <laughs> with that, um, talking about the psychology of shooting deer with the bow and stuff like that. So I did. I calmed myself down. <sighs> I'm really rambling here, but... <laughs> I just want to give you an idea of my mindset because when I saw the deer, it's like I knew it was him. And normally I would go, I'm going to say just bat shit crazy and, and get all emotional and, 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 you know, adrenaline flowing. But for some reason that didn't happen to me. I was excited. The adrenaline came in, but it was, it turned into this, all right, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. If it's not, it's not. And so I literally got, I just turned on the camera. I zoom way out because I didn't want to miss it. And there's no footage here of this deer coming. He's just standing there. And I can see the deer clearly. I pull up the crossbow and I'm looking through the scope. And I'm like, oh, oh there's, there's, he's standing broadside. This is looking pretty good. And then I double checked down on my camera and I came back up and I just wanted to make sure I was steady. And I just squeezed off and it's just boop. That bolt goes off, and I mean, everything goes. So it was a different experience. I never expected it. Everything is like a shotgun went off. Every deer in that area just exploded out of the corn. The deer took off. It happened quick. I'm just seeing tunnel vision. I was confused, to be, to be honest with you, because I didn't see the big picture. I was confused, but it's like, well, I know I smoked him. Because I just watched the arrow and I heard the crack. I mean, I've heard that many times. And the way he took off, it's like I felt, I, I must have, I smoked him, you know. But we're talking about, uh, you know, it was a long shot. I wouldn't have shot the deer without a crossbow. So hats off to 10 point. My Lord, what a, what a product, you know. And I'm watching my, my app that night looking for, you know, is there any action over by dad in the stand and. I see him get out of the stand a little bit earlier than shooting light. Oh, ended. you did catch me, huh? <laughs> I thought, hmm, <laughs> that's interesting. Because <Yeah. laughs> I was going to try and play the surprise, you know. Well, you got to well, go down and see what's going on before you start, you know, letting people know, hey, come help me or whatever. And um, so I was like, well, it's still pretty light out, you know, and I gave it a few minutes and blah, blah, blah. But now I'm kind of getting a little more excited, but. It just felt off. You know, I just didn't, I don't know what it was. And by the way, I'm in COVID. Now, I, I, we had COVID in the house. Wife was really sick. We don't want to get too much into that. I had to call the ambulance. 
She's doing great now. I had super light symptoms, but we had been locked down for quite a few days in a row. And uh, I only lost my taste for 12 hours and had a little light headache and some things like that. But so I'm in COVID protocol. I can't be around anybody at the time. And so I just, I'm just not feeling, I don't know what it was. It was like, I wasn't feeling bummed out or depressed, but I just wasn't like myself. Let's just say that. And so I get down and I'm wondering, and now I'm like second don't, don't guessing. Don't give them too much here. Yeah, I don't want to give them too much. <laughs> I'm second guessing in this and that. But anyway, long story short, I didn't see any blood. I didn't see any hair. And it was going to get dark. And so I'm not going to blow the place up. I just pull out. And... uh well, we found I wonder him. if he got him. Do you think he got him? <laughs> <laughs> to be determined. <laughs> to be different, determined. Well, it, it was a crazy recovery. Let's put it that way. There, that's a story in itself. Yeah. Again, one that, one that you're going to have to see. This is, you know, not obviously not a lot of video uh, of the deer <clears throat> right there coming in, but so much content of this deer over the years. Another one that you guys have built history with and sheds off of. Um, one thing I want to ask is, so, you know, when this deer came out, Tell me about that whole situation. What do you think was on his mind? You know, these does came out, they were feeding, standing corn. Do you think that this was a 100% food source situation? Do you think he had something else on his mind? What do you think? I mean, I'm highly convinced that based on his behavior is that it's post-rut and he's looking for those last does. And to me, there's it's no question in my mind, that he's still looking for those last does. Now, because it's post-rut, their behavior, excuse me, is starting to getting in, into that mindset of, I need to replenish my, you know, my body. So food is, 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 is a, a light factor there, but he's hanging in that timber, letting them does go out to food. And he was in there and walked right to where the does were trying to find out, is there anybody yet to go in here around here? So it was a post rut looking for those does. He had shrunken his territory down because of the post rut, because he's going to be close betting to food. So that, that's starting, the behavior starting to kick in. But in my opinion, based on his behavior through that whole week, he was definitely looking for the, the, the last does but he was shrinking his core to the food betting behavior. So that, that's, that's my take on it. Definitely two amazing bucks sitting here. Um, two really cool stories, which again, uh, hunt breakdowns coming, white tails from scratch, uh, really cool stuff ahead. So keep an eye out on, on deer study YouTube, but I want to just finish this podcast off with where are we at now? So, you know, we're getting into December. Um, it's getting cold here in Minnesota. Um, transitioning from the post rut now into that kind of late season pattern. Um, you know, I, I think I look at this time of year before I throw this to JJ, I look at this time of year as, as an exciting one. It's, it can be one of my favorite times to hunt just because deer get back on the, on the food sources. They become patternable again. Uh, I've noticed on my cameras over the years that typically have some new bucks show up this time of year. Um, if you have some food, um, you know, deer, new deer can move in. So that can be exciting. Um, and, you know, moving cameras right now to back to those food sources, almost like uh, the beginning of the year, early season. So applying some of those same tactics now um, going into late season. But uh, JJ, you're tagged out here in Minnesota, but uh, Chris has still got a tag in his pocket. Uh, I know you guys are going to be helping him. What are you looking for? Yeah, like you said, late season, you can get some new bucks coming in and you shift back to that pattern. That was the early season pattern. Now, the only difference is it's really cold, which I hate. <laughs> your toes, your feet, um, stands are noisy, creaky. You don't have any cover going in and out. There's no leaves. The grass is matted down. Um, right now, currently, there's no snow here. So that's kind of throwing things off a little bit. It's warm. It's going to be 50 degrees tomorrow. There's, you know, they're st they can still browse wherever they want. So it's not really focusing deer movement into any, you know, specific or a particular food source right now. Um, but like I was telling Chris, or we were talking with Chris yesterday, it's like, you know, late season here, you could really use a foot of snow because we got a ton of food and that's really going to pull the deer in and, and condense them for you quite a bit more and get them on their feet in daylight. 
and we could always use another new big buck showing up. But um, but right now it's warm, it's mild. I mean, they can still hit all the green sources that have been pretty much eaten down to nothing, all the rye and oats we have out, all the green stuff. Um, so right now, I mean, you can still get them pretty much anywhere um, on, on all kinds of different food sources, greens, um, grains, water holes. But when it gets cold up here, we get snow, the water freezes, that limits that, you know, source. And they're really going to push into a standing grain. So we'll see if we if we have a, a snowy white late season or not. That's kind of the big the big factor right now because it's pretty much the rut's basically gone. And it's that early season type of pattern again where it's bedding to food, bedding to food. And late season it condenses even more to where it bedding is real close to food. Um, so it can be tough, but it can also be really fun. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Um, you know, and everybody's different. I mean, obviously this isn't going to work down in South Florida, you know. Um, but the same basic concept, I got a comment from a guy on Facebook. He sent me a message and he's like, man, I can't, I just can't thank you enough for your podcast, blah, 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 blah. He says, what you did this year with talking about where the progression is, from week to week, and we tried to do it weekly. Of course, now we shot some bucks and stuff, and, and holidays were there. We missed a couple of weeks. But um, he said exactly what you said is exactly what was happening, and the tips and the stuff that you were telling us is exactly what I did, and that's how I got my buck, and I can't thank you enough. And so that, that makes you feel good, that what we're saying isn't just a bunch of BS. You know, it's definitely our opinion. It's definitely what we're seeing. But the fact that it's helping people is 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 really really a good thing. And that's why I kind of really wanted to get back into the podcast here too. And JJ and, and you, of course, too, were pushing for it. So there's been a little gap. Now you shot your buck on the 17th of November, 20th. Yeah, the 20th. I shot mine after Thanksgiving. What day was that? I don't know. Was it 26? It was Friday. It was the the 26th. Okay, and now tomorrow's December 1st. And so what I'm seeing is because of the weather, um, it's not, you still got that window. And I told Chris this, I said, you still got a window for them to be kind of what my window was. They're still going to look for a few does that haven't been bred into that first week in December. You know, that even happens when it's cold out. And the fact that they don't absolutely have to have the food means you're going to still see them maybe hitting some green, especially your does, fawns, um, stuff like that, because the greens are still accessible. They're still using them, I know for a fact, because uh, they're exposed. And so I think we're one step closer to late season and food is the top dog to there's still a behavior of looking for some does. So use that to your advantage. I think they're, they're still a little bit into that pattern. Because we're still seeing a few deer, you know, going in those core areas looking for, you know, dough. You can tell it's a social thing. It's not a food thing. And the other thing to really keep in mind, and once again, this doesn't matter in South Florida, but freezing water, water access is, you know, a little bit more important than you might think. We watched the deer change their behavior where they were visiting based off of freezing and water access. Okay, so that, keep that factor in mind, too. So I'm saying post-rut, still a chance, watching, following, looking for does. Food becomes definitely more important, but when it's mild, not near what you would think in a standing cornfield or beans because they don't, you know, have to have it. Um, they'll still hit greens. They'll still browse because, you, you know, there's no snow. So basically I'm saying what JJ's saying. Um, but yeah, I think you can still kind of stay in that semi post rut, ruddish type thought process today here in Minnesota because of the no snow. And I would hunt accordingly. I would hunt the exact same thing way me and JJ just shot our two bucks. Exact, yeah, exact e same I'd way. I'd say evenings are going to be a little bit better option than the mornings, you yep. know. Both um, of our kills were evening hunts. But Brian, you still got to tag. What are you going to do? That's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I think that there's opportunities right now to 
uh, kind of be in the timber in some of those spots. I have already started to transition my cameras to food sources. And I can tell you right now that I don't have a picture of a really good deer that I want to go in and, and chase on a food source. Now, do I think that if I went and dove into some of those spots like you're talking about that are in the timber, um, I think a lot of deer are browsing right now because they can't in the woods. They don't have to go to those big food sources. So um, my strategy right now is to probably play it a little cool. Gun season just got out here. We still have a muzzleloader season in now. Um, mm-hmm. I am going to play it a little patient, give the deer a few days, I think, to just unwind uh, and pray for snow uh, to drive into those food sources. Again, I love hunting that that late season push here in Minnesota where it gets really cold, snow on the ground, uh, patternable deer. Again, it's one of those things, you know, I got obviously work, wife, boys at home, you know, you, you pick your, you have your good hunting windows and then you have your windows where uh, y- you have a family and you got to pick those windows too. So um, I- I'm torn. I want to get out there and, and, you know, hunt. But again, it's like we talked about in, in our previous podcast, how much do you dive in? How aggressive do you get? Um, when you know there's potentially better to come, it's, it's a gamble, you know, so trying to navigate that gamble right now and, uh, and we'll see how late season goes. Yeah. You were talking about the browsing pretty much. They can browse anywhere in the timber and then kind of looking back at one of our podcasts, um, in October, we talked about corn a lot, Well, we noticed this year, you know, that we got a more controlled environment, you know, our own property that when they did cut that corn, Brian was right. They were piling right into it that night. Yeah. Um, but also without any snow on the ground, I mean, they can eat anywhere in the entire field. It's not like they're going to one corner or standing corn over cut corn. I mean, a bean field, a corn field, if it's harvested, there's little grain, you know, there's t- grains all over. Um, also, we had they're a, everywhere. So yeah, it's we like, had a how har- do you pattern that when they can be anywhere in the field? When they can walk into the field anywhere too. They're not really necessarily using any pinch point from the timber to that spot. And we thought maybe because we had a, a hard pan, uh, we got a new farmer in, and he wanted to chisel it um, this year. We thought, well, they're not going to want that, you know, that big bumpy stuff. <laughs> they could care less. They, in fact, I think they like it, you know. But they're walking out and going out in the middle of nowhere, and it, it it's totally different. Yeah, and when we get a freeze and some snow, that'll all change, and they'll shift right into that standing grain. So. And the other thing I noticed when we were doing recoveries, is uh the beans we got standing beans and i know that is like the 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 best possible protein source they can get when it gets snow on the ground heavy and hard winter that that's pure protein for them um the corn is more of a carbohydrate there's some protein in it but they use that for fat i think and um what people you have to understand up here once again it's not the same thing in south florida but when it gets super cold here, these deer almost go into a hibernation type thing. And the, these are windows. And we, we, we'll talk about this as we go. I don't want to jump ahead of myself. But cold season is a completely different strategy than where we are today. Well, you were going to say something like they haven't touched our beans. They have not touched our beans. Yeah, they haven't touched the standing they, beans. I mean, they're a little bit of nibbling on the outside edges, but the pods are full through the whole field. Yeah. Great. You know what that means when it gets cold? That's why I'm excited about it. Yep. Well, there you have it. Some great tips. If you still got a tag in your pocket, you know, maybe look for for Bucks Cruising, uh, finding those last few does. And as it transitions, we're going to do some more podcasts here as as the season transitions and we get some cold weather. We'll do some late season stuff. But uh, guys, congratulations. Some unbelievable deer. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Um, make sure that you watch out for Whitetails from Scratch coming up here on YouTube. If you haven't downloaded the Deer Society app, do so. It's free on the Google Play Store or, or the App Store. Uh, thanks for listening. More good stuff coming. And uh, good luck if you still got a tag in your pocket. Well, I'm a deer.